why Russia and Europe will come together. And we started off with how, and I decided that uh, it might be better if we went with why, because uh, we've had a few things happen in the last 50 years that have illustrated we weren't just too sure on how it would happen, but we have never just, uh, lost sight of why it would happen. We've never lost sight of what the record said would happen, but we're not just too sure how it will happen. And I think you can see as we go through this that there are some things that are, are still surprising to us. Well, as we go through this, and uh, we want to make sure that this is proceeding. Whoops, there we are. It finally works. Why Russia and Europe will come together? Well, I've labeled uh, a few steps we should take in this. You know, this is one of the things that you're supposed to remember before you start. You've got to put this little connector in here. It doesn't work without that. <laughs> now we've got it going. So first of all, their coming together is certain because the author of the Bible who knows the future states it will happen. We've read our Bibles. We've seen what it says. We've looked at the reasons why we believe these names in Ezekiel 38 represent uh, nations that we can identify. So we first of all believe it because the Bible says it. But we also believe it because to accomplish his, that is God's purpose with his people Israel, he will bring them together. And there's a difference between the Bible saying it and God causing it. Because it's not that God looks at the future and somehow is able to say these things without ever doing anything. He tells us, as we'll see, very specifically, that he will do th certain things in bringing them together. We also believe that Europe will have reason to invade the Middle East under Russian leadership, which is just following the details of the passage. At some stage, they will be attracted to Jerusalem to attempt to take control and to divide the spoil. So that's coming again right out of the chapter. But, as we see in other companion Bible prophecies, all nations will find Jerusalem to be a burdensome stone, especially to those who rise up against her. And that's the kind of thing that we can see in history, that when God says there is a boundary, or there's a limit, or there's something that's going to follow as a consequence of what people have done, we are just as assured that when it says it here, it will happen. Now, as I said to start with, we live in wonderful days, brothers and sisters, young people. We, we just see so much of what the Bible has talked about and constantly need to remember that this book and these prophecies is going back 2,500 years. What other book, what other source of information could we have anywhere that's 2,500 years old and could tell us what's going to happen in our day. The Bible is a standout book, and this is one of the standout prophecies in Joel chapter 3, where it says, Behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted by land. It's a standout passage because, well, Tel Aviv, for instance, is an example. The sand dunes was all that was there a hundred years ago. And here we have this modern city arising. Uh, yes, there's not too many of us that could claim that we were able to see that a hundred years ago, but our parents uh, may have known about it, or certainly our grandparents had followed this through. And so in just these few generations, we have seen so much of the Bible come to pass to give us an indication of the days in which we live. So seeing Judah and Jerusalem come out of captivity, we now look to this verse 2, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the exciting part of how Jerusalem is attracting, or nations are attracted to Jerusalem. 
And one of the things that we want to illustrate is just a few of how that, uh, occurrences of how that's happening. So the latter years, Ezekiel 38 verse 8 says, After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, gathered out of many people, against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely all of them. And that's about what you get out of a more modern version, the ESV. It's about the same. There's nothing really changed there. This has been the way it's been said for 25, 2600 years. That at the time when Israel is brought forth out of the nations, God's going to do something with, it, involving the people of Israel, but it's going to be in, bring a nation which will be an enemy up against them the nation that's gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. So it's, it's certain what the prophecy is telling us. And you know, when we do our research, and uh, our forefathers have done their research, and, and uh, we challenge our young people to, to get into Genesis chapter 10, find out where these nations were. And so we can go into an old map, that talks about the ancient world and the descendants of Noah. And we can see these nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38, first of all, were largely mentioned in Genesis 10, because it was the spreading forth of the sons uh, of uh, Japheth, as it mentions in verse 2, Gomer and Magog and Tubal and Meshech and Gomer and Togarma, all these nations that reoccur in Ezekiel 38. So anyone who knows their Bible has a real in on this because you can just see that what one part of the Bible is talking about, another one is expanding on. That's the beauty of the Bible. That's what we would expect if we knew that the Bible had one author who was able to direct men in various centuries of time to say a little more about what he had first revealed. So. That's really quite supportive when you see that people who aren't Christadelphians don't have any ax to grind, but they just know that's, that's roughly where history tells us these people were. So again, looking at uh, the descendants of Noah by Ren McNally, this is just coming out of the program Esword. So if you have Esword, you have all this in there. And it just tells us like there's Gomer, there's Magog, and that these are nations of Europe and it says the descendants of Gomer, up here in this top part here, the descendants of, uh, I didn't really want to do that. Let's get back to where we were here. That's the one I wanted to push. It is, uh, it's pushing everything, so we just better not use that. The descendants of Gomer occupied probably Germany, France, Spain, and the British Isles. So when we look at Gomer, when we look at Magog, when we look at Rosh, we are looking at this part of Europe, the whole part of Europe. If we talk about Russia and Europe coming together, we're talking about Russia on our right side here, on the, the east of Europe, coming together in some way with Western Europe to do what the Bible says must happen. Now we've looked at this in, in many years. I can remember you know, listening to brethren talk about this and until it, it came for my time to talk in public about this and try to illustrate what did we mean by that. And uh, I have a slide uh, coming up here which will show you the charts that we used at that particular time. So did we vary in 50 years? No, we've stayed with this chapter because we believe it, it identifies Rosh as Russia it identifies these European nations, and there was no reason to believe there was somebody else. But just before we get into the details of that, I wanted to illustrate the second point that we were trying to raise. That is that it's not only that God could foresee this, and so he could tell us about something that hadn't happened. God says he will be involved. So looking at Ezekiel 38 verse 4, it says, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And it's roughly the same in the ESV. God says, I will do this. 
Now, we know the way God works is using people. There, there may be circumstances of, of events that uh, we could say could really only be an act of God, that those things are so coordinated, and history has a lot of them, where storms happened, or uh, some, for some reason people were taken off guard, or they panicked, or something like that. So when God works, you can usually see it, and uh, people would say, well, it, is that really God? Well, you don't see God acting as a, as a being, but you can see the evidence of his work, and that's the prediction that God will do it. For people like us who believe that God's name is a particular name that talks about that he will be or he will do things, when we see it in the record, I will turn thee back, I will bring thee forth, you can see that same authority that's right there from the beginning of the Bible of what our God will do. And that's the strength of the belief we have in the fulfillment of these things. Again, in Daniel chapter 2, in verse 44, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. It's not just that God could see this was going to happen. He says he will do it. He will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. You know, one of the things that, to some extent, we might even feel a little disappointed and almost despair of is how evil this world is getting. And you sort of wonder just how far it's going to go before God will intervene. I think these verses are very reassuring that however men decide or women decide or together nations decide what they think they're going to try to do with this world, God has a plan which has been revealed, and it's just a matter of time until it happens. Again, in Zechariah chapter 14, these are all passages which are well entrenched in the, the, the prophetic word that we have inherited from our forefathers. In verse 1 of chapter 14, Behold, the day of, of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go forth in, into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So primarily you see God saying he's going to do these things. And we live in a world that less and less acknowledgement of a God at all, given any name. And yet God has said these things, and it's the basis of our belief it will happen. So again, in Joel chapter 3, God says, He will bring back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. The world doesn't see it, but people who believe the Bible rejoice to see that. I wasn't old enough to to uh, rejoice over the, the birth of the nation of Israel, but I certainly had a lot to, to rejoice over when Jerusalem became free in 1967. And those things were landmarks uh, in our prophetic basis for, for predicting that, uh, you know, what God has said before will certainly come to pass. So uh, just a little review of this. I want to move quickly through this because it's, uh, it should be pretty standard for us that this word chief, which we find in Ezekiel 38 in the King James Version, uh, it's, I've quoted the RV here, but it doesn't need to be the RV. It could be other versions who also have seen clearly that the word chief should be translated rosh. And so we have in the prophetic word, chief, rosh, or as we would say today, Russia. In Alpha's Israel, John Thomas uh, says this, and it's an interesting little aspect of what he did say, that Gog of the land of Magog, that is, styling the ruler of Magog by the latter syllable of the name of the country over which he rules. We have seen that Magog is the region extending from the Rus or Russia to the Rhine, comprehending Wallachia, Trans uh, Transylvania, um, Hungary, and Germany. 
Of course, the prophecy must be future because the Prince of Rosh is the Gog of Magog, and as yet, no emperor of Russia has been also emperor of Germany, etc. Now, this may not be too uh, revealing for people who already have studied this, but for our young people who are putting some time into this to try to be convinced of this, it's these kinds of things that you see in the writings of our pioneers which are really reassuring. That these people didn't come up with an idea and just write it down. Though they, they saw there's questions to be asked. There's answers to be obtained. Like, how can you be certain about this? How can you be sure it's not some other time period? How, how can you be sure that, that, um, that Russia hasn't already done this or some king in the past hasn't already done this? And that's what I very much appreciate myself about the writings of our pioneers is that they didn't overlook those things. They did deal with them. So many peoples of Europe with Russia, as you remember from the map, we spoke about Gomer and also the house of Togarma was there. And uh, they have to be part of that group of nations. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them. And isn't it just amazing, brothers and sisters, young people, that, you know, we turn on the news or we read something about the news of the day and you see these nations being mentioned. They may not be mentioned as Persia, although that doesn't, you know, stay out of the news entirely. People still remember that Iran and Iraq were their roots were. But Ethiopia and uh, that huge dam they're building in, in uh, Ethiopia, which is, is going to be a problem for Egypt downstream in the Nile, and uh, the things that have happened in Libya, all these nations that were prophesied about 2,700 years ago, and here they are on the world stage before our eyes. So brothers and sisters, it's not a time that we need to be weak in our faith because all these things strengthened what we have believed in times past. It's just to try to take it all in. So a little summary paragraph from Alpha's Israel will illustrate how, illustrate how John Thomas sort of paraphrased that. So he says, Son of man, this is uh, Ezekiel 38, 2 to 7, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the emperor of Germany, Hungary, etc., the autocrat of Russia, Muscovy and Tobolsky, and prophesy against them and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, uh, autocrat of Russia, Muscovy and Tobolsky, I will turn thee about, put a hook into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth from the north parts, and all of thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them accounted, or accounted, accounted with, that's an unusual word, but uh, that's just one of the things we deal with in Alpha's Israel, with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, among whom shall be the Persians, Ethiopians, and Libyans all of them with shields and helmet, French and Italians, Circassians, Cossacks, and Tartar hordes of Uzbek, etc., and many people not particularly named besides. Be thou prepared, prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled with thee, and be thou the imperial chief to them. So it sometimes is good to, to paraphrase so that people really understand the modern names that we could apply to those nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And just a little word about this, uh, brothers and sisters, about a word like you saw there, we were stumbling over a little bit, a, crout, a, a crouched, or I'm not too sure how to pronounce that, but it's not a word I would use very often, but it just means that they're, they're, uh, they have all that armor, they're, they're attired with that, that armor. Uh, one of the things that I, I do at home is uh, we have a CHC school, Crescent Elfian Heritage College, in our ecclesial hall in uh, Brantford, uh, uh, Hamilton area. And we have uh, probably 25, 30 students, and I had the pleasure to teach grade 7 and grade 8 uh, some things about the Bible study, and we did that for the whole year. And we took the book, The Trial, that was written by Robert Roberts. And we did it for the specific reason of trying to illustrate to the young people of today that you can actually read those books. That because they have big words doesn't mean to say that they were written for some other age. You can actually take a dictionary, have it beside you. So we read the whole book during class time. 
And uh, the children, you know, they had difficulty, like all of us do, with pronouncing words we've never seen before. But after a while, the, the children were able to, to get some kind of an idea of what a word would mean before they looked it up by just how it's used. And I think it's essential to try to get our young people to read our, our pioneering books, to be able to, to uh, not be afraid of it. And I guess one of the worst things we can do is to suggest to them that, oh yeah, there's big words there and you'll have a hard time with it. That's just an attitude towards it. But to not understand those books is to not to see where we have come from and how long ago people put hours and hours and hours into this study. This didn't come by John Thomas uh, just writing it down. He had to put his hours of study and he was studying people who had done their hours of study. Sometimes it's hard to realize just how much work would have gone into being able to write a summary paragraph like that. <clears throat> While Russia guards the others, it does say that in the verse seven, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. And uh, that's probably the way we've always looked at the idea of guard. I remember you know, brethren speaking about these prophetic things in my early years, and it was always that they, they would be hedged in with thorns. So they, they didn't have any choice in this matter. They were going to be conquered by, by Russia. Now, we've had a little bit of a reason to, to question whether that will be quite the case. And, and even very recently, uh, to question it again to see what Russia has done down in Crimea and, and the reasons why they went into Crimea and how they have said that they would defend other Russian speaking uh, areas of nations that once were part of the Soviet Union. Very interesting. Now that's the chart that I used uh, back in 1967. And uh, we were going through uh, with some public lectures and that's the actual chart, just a picture of it. And, and, um, and it illustrates the things that we were saying. You can probably recognize there that that's not different from many charts that you may have seen that were variations of it. But one of the pleasurable things about that chart was that was made on a, on a floor in the house of one of the brethren of, of, a, of a city that we were lecturing in. And the young people all got together and uh, one brother had the ability to lay it all out and he, he did all the pencil work. And then the young people came along and they painted it. Now, since we don't use charts, not really anymore, there still are some cases where people use charts, but uh, we've lost that, that idea of, of getting together to prepare ourselves to go out in a campaign on this topic. When a, when a brother does it on PowerPoint, he does it all in his, his study and he comes out and presents it, We've lost something because we, we don't work together to do that anymore like we used to do. And there used to be a real an excitement in an ecclesia when you could work together to get prepared for some event that you're putting on for the public. I just think that's uh, something we shouldn't forget. But look at what we were saying 50 years ago about Russia. And this was when they were still in the Soviet Union. Russia in Israel, uh, Russia advances to world conquest. Increasing communist peril challenges the West. 23 wars against the Reds in 20 years since World War II. Over a thousand million held under communism. Domination of a quarter of the world's land area. 20 year average of one million enslaved each week. Reds believe they will conquer the world in 20 years. Massive stockpiling of terrifying war weapons. The coming in, uh, Russian invasion of Israel will plunge all nations into World War III. Now, I don't know, but some of you older ones might even remember the language, and you may be able to detect uh, the author of some of those phrases because uh, he wasn't part of, uh, he wasn't a person in Canada. He was a person in Australia that actually uh, phrased that together, a young man at that time. And uh, that was what we saw. That was the Soviet Union. Um, I don't know, there'd be a few of you would remember Sputnik. Do you know what I mean by Sputnik? Well, the Americans were really offended and, and terrified by the fact that after developing those very powerful atomic weapons at the end of World War II, that Russia could send a, a little 
uh, space globe right over America that just kept on going over and just getting the Americans riled up. I think it was 1957, somewhere back in, the, in those days. Well, that's the kind of thing that was the mentality behind those words. People were terrified that World War III was about to be uh, fought and that it would be an atomic war. Do we feel that way today? Like 50 years later, do we still believe that we're likely to, to have World War III break out with atomic weapons? Well, it is interesting, isn't it? If you've followed the news recently, that even the, the Russian leader has, has reminded the world that he has all these atomic uh, weapons in storage and that uh, they are quite prepared to use them. It's interesting, I thought, that that should reoccur about 50 years in between what happened. Now, you may know those two brethren, but I had the pleasure of being on stage with those in California when that was uh, Brother Maury Stewart in California. He used to have that program, This Is Your Bible, and it was every week, and he got a lot of people in Southern California quite interested in the Bible because of that program where he spoke on prophecy. That was his set. And that day he had Brother Purse Mansfield on and they were, they were talking back and forth as, as those two could about Bible prophecy. But that was what we were saying in the 70s, in the 80s. And, in the, and uh, when it came to the, the later part of the 80s and the 90s, we had to really think again about this because the Soviet Union just went to pieces about that time. Like we never saw this happening. The Berlin Wall came down. I, I can't remember any brother, any group, of Christadelphians speaking about the likelihood that the, the Berlin Wall would come down peaceably. The fact that that came down peaceably seemed to take everybody by surprise, and that's why sometimes you have to just back off a little bit of how God will do this. We don't doubt that he will, and that he involved, will be involved in doing this, but that was a surprise, that that could happen peacefully. And then the whole Soviet Union collapsed just in the next year, in 1990. And uh, you can see the, the dates of where this happened. In some cases, yeah, they did have conflict when the Warsaw Pact uh, nations sort of uh, disbanded and NATO was, was trying to take advantage of this. And there was several areas throughout Europe where there was a lot of strife. Now we've come through that, brothers and sisters. So some brethren, some sisters thought maybe we're wrong on this. Like maybe Russia, since the Soviet Union collapsed, wasn't what Ezekiel 38 was talking about. It was, it was some other people. But you know, you, you, you can't do that with the Word of God. We, we had researched it. We had looked at the research of others. This was to be Rus, Russia, up there in the uttermost parts of the north. It was to involve the nations of Gomer and Magog, that we're told spread out over Europe. How could it be any different than what that research had led us to? So as we have waited and as we have seen, a new Russia is rising. And it, in some senses, is as uh, scary as the other Russia in the Soviet Union, but there are very significant differences. This man, who knows whether he will be the man that, that does these things. He, he certainly has uh, some characteristics which are quite different than Khrushchev. If you remember Khrushchev and Brezhnev and some of those old Russian leaders who could take their shoes off and pound the table of the United Nations and make their point, but they didn't have one thing that this man has. And I want to just go through that just carefully with you. So it says that I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken. So one of the things that Russia really needs to have is, is to illustrate there's some interest in Jerusalem. What is the interest that, that Russia has in Jerusalem? Well, Sister Dorothy and I took a, a little tour of Israel. I uh, would really suggest that maybe brethren and sisters could do this. We, we did it on the, our 40th wedding anniversary. We thought we just go to Israel. We just went to Israel. We rented a car. We drove around. But we had something in mind. We wanted to see who were the stakeholders in Jerusalem. Who had the interest in the outcome of Jerusalem? Who wanted to, 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 uh, 
to take it over or who wanted to make sure that they weren't left out. So when you look at the stakeholders of, of Jerusalem, there is the Latin Quarter. Distinctly, the, the Roman Catholic Church is there in the Latin Quarter. There's the Arab Quarter, and you can certainly see the, the influence and the, the rivalry between the Jews and the Arabs. Then there's the Jewish Quarter, and then there is the Greek Quarter. There's those four quarters of Jerusalem. So to really understand who the stakeholders are, you have to see who is behind the Latin Quarter. Like who is really interested in the Arab part? What is the interest that the Jews have in the old city? And what is the interest of the Greek Quarter? And uh, you only have to walk a little bit towards the Mount of Olives to see that Russia has some real estate in Jerusalem. Like Russia has some interest. They already have some real estate there. And this church, the Church of Mary Magdalene stands out. Well, you can see by the way the design of the roof is that, uh, yeah, they, that come from Russia. And Russia is an, an important area of study to see what Russia's interest is in Jerusalem, historically, and uh, how that and behind the scenes from time to time, they, they, they have some interest in dealing with the, the government of Israel to uh, satisfy some of their their concerns about the real estate. But we never saw that with Khrushchev. You never saw that with Brezhnev, these other leaders of Russia. This is unique. And this is something which gives us uh, some substance to talk about why uh, Russia and Europe will come together. Because this man, uh, you know, you never want to say too much about a person's personal belief, but he would certainly appear to be religious, but whether there really is any religion in him or not will, will be seen in time. Whether his association with these other leaders is, is just to advance his own political agenda or whether he really has some genuine interest in it. I, I doubt the genuine interest. Uh, just a couple of quotes from some modern uh, writers on this. Uh, I don't know how many of you actually look at the snippets that's coming out from uh, Brother Don Pierce in England, but I found this a wonderful resource to, to, uh, to speak on prophecy, is just to see where people are. So now look at this. This is from Forbes. It's uh, 25th, uh, or the 21st of May of this year. It says, when Putin came to power, he shrewdly noted the... Uh, Russian Orthodox Church's a useful role in boosting nationalism and the fact that it shared his view of Russia's role in the world and began to work towards strengthening the church's role in Russian society. Now, this is not me saying this. This is not Chris and Elfie. This is not John Thomas. This is one of the newspapers commenting on what they see Russia doing under Putin that he seems to see there's some value in associating himself with the Russian Orthodox Church. So early in his presidency, the Russian Duma passed a law returning all church property seized during the Soviet era, which alone made the, the Russian Orthodox Church one of the largest landowners in Russia. And over the past decade and a half, Putin has ordered state-owned energy firms to contribute billions to the rebuilding of thousands of churches destroyed under the Soviets, and many of those rich oligarchs surrounding him are dedicated supporters of the, Roman, or the Russian Orthodox Church who have contributed to the growing influence of the church in myriad ways. Now, I think I put a highlight on this because around 25,000 churches have been built or rebuilt since the early 1990s, the vast majority of which have been built during Putin's rule and largely due to his backing and that of those in his close circle of supporters. We never would have thought of that happening under any of the Russian rulers of 50 years ago. So this is a new wrinkle and it's an interesting wrinkle because of what Putin's doing apart from this. Now here again, this is Forbes this is almost a year later, uh, not a year later, but uh, a month later, rather, where he says, Vladimir Putin and Alexander Dugin, now, Alexander Dugin is an advisor to Putin, 
that their vision of Holy Russia, which is shared with the Russian Orthodox Church, sees Russia's mission as being to expand its influence and authority until it dominates the Eurasian landmass by means of a strong, centralized Russian state aligned with the Russian Orthodox Church, championing traditional uh, social values over against the cultural corruption of a libertine West. Now, just to save a little bit of time, I think that's all we need to read. Now, that's the kind of thing that we see out there. It's, it's in the press, it's in the media, it's on TV, it's in the news magazines. It tells us that there's something about Russia it going religious to accomplish a bigger end. And the bigger end is to dominate Europe. Well, that's, that's really quite an interesting thing, isn't it? To think that Russia would actually go to do that. Well, they put on quite a display. You think of the, of the money it took to revitalize this church, Christ the Savior Cathedral in Moscow, after it was uh, very largely destroyed uh, by the former Soviet Union. And a, and a picture like this, you can hardly imagine it. And the news magazines just jump on something like this to see Putin crossing himself uh, with the Pope. Like who would ever expected the Pope and the, and, the, and the Russian leader to ever be together 20 years ago? These things are unique in our day to see how it's happening and where it's leading is uh, really challenging. So it says, uh, again in the Moynihan letters, uh, June 10th, so we're getting very close to where we are presently, President Putin came to Pope Francis this evening to speak about the possible pathways to peace in Ukraine and the Middle East. Putin had been in Milan, in northern Italy, at a major international expedition on food worldwide, arrived a little after 6 p.m., about an hour later than anticipated, and the two of them spent about 50 minutes talking together privately through interpreters. Now, that's the nice way of saying that. The fact was that Putin was an hour late for his meeting with the Pope, and the media picked it up like, who else in the world would keep the Pope waiting for a whole hour except the president of Russia? The exchange gifts with Pope Francis giving Putin a medallion depicting an angel of peace in evident hope that Putin might yet be a leader who could work for world peace. Now, this is uh, really an, a, an interesting aspect of modern society where one of the, one of the main features of meeting of, of leaders is for a photo op so that then the, the whole media can take these pictures and make what they want out of them. But why would the Pope ever give him uh, a, a medallion depicting an angel of peace? Follow the next sentence here. This is a medallion of the angel of peace executed by an, uh, an artist of the last century, the Pope said to Putin, according to journalists who were present to report on the meeting. It is the angel who vanquishes all wars and speaks of solidarity among all peoples. And he gives it to Putin. Well, I guess there are some mysterious things going on in that sense. But uh, here's another one. I'm sure many of you have been following this of just seeing the dependence that Europe has upon Russian energy. And uh, we've been seeing pictures and pictures of this in the press of the number of pipelines bringing uh, either gas or oil from Russia into Europe. Uh, one of the ones being so interesting is this uh, last one, and I got this just off the internet yesterday. Because... We've seen all kinds of plans for these pipelines, and we know that they were intending to go with a pipeline into Bulgaria, and uh, that was called the South Stream. They canceled that one. They were thinking of bringing one down into Turkey and then going through Turkey, but really what they've decided to do is come under the Black Sea and go into Turkey and then into Greece. Do you think there was any reasons behind that, other than maybe it's shorter or it would cost less or something like that? Well, when you think of that waterway, that's the very, very narrow waterway in the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, where Soviet might in its, in its navy, that, uh, you know, they've got Crimea, they've, they've, they're building up their navy in that area, but if it's got no outlet other than the Black Sea, 
it's not much use to them. So this bridge, now I had the pleasure to go across that bridge from Istanbul, uh, across to, uh, to other part of Turkey, which we were going on our way down to see the, the ecclesias of, uh, of Revelation 2 and 3, and just to, to go around and see what was left of those places. But we crossed that bridge, and you could see the narrow harbor. Now, I think the fact that, uh, if we just go back to that slide, that that gas pipeline that comes down there is very, very close to Istanbul. And Russia would have a very good reason to make sure that that is, is supported and protected. And if need be, if there's any stir of the people, come down there and, uh, and make sure that Russian interests are maintained. Now, for the first time, I'd never seen this before, but that's an extension across Greece into Italy. Now, there's been many plans, and, uh, you know, it depends on what you're one... I, this is one up, I think, because it, it was yesterday's plan. <laughs> Whether it's next week's plan or not, you, I can't be sure about that. But if they're planning on bringing gas down under the Black Sea, through Turkey, just a little bit of Turkey at Istanbul, and through Greece and across into Italy, I suspect there's a lot of thinking that's gone into that. A lot of planning, a lot of, of understanding of where nations are. How is it that Greece is in the news so much? And how is it that Russia has said, said that they would support Greece and that they would help Greece get back to work and pay its debt? How is it that, uh, that this comes in right beside the city, which is, uh, was for many years called the second Rome, the third Rome being Moscow, and now Moscow having such a great interest in putting that gas line so close to Istanbul? Well, we don't know just how that's going to work out, but it is quite interesting to follow, and uh, that must yet provide some interesting things. Well, the prophecy of, of Daniel is just depicted from a copy of, of the front page of the Bible magazine, illustrating that the image must stand together. Uh, inside it, it says it must stand together because the Bible says so. It says, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So it wasn't a matter of, of breaking them up over the centuries since they, you know, we've last known about them, but there's got to be a way they come together. And some of those nations involve, or some of those pieces involve Europe. And uh, what we see in the in gas pipelines, what we see with, the, uh, with Putin being so outwardly looking religious that he would go and visit the Pope and that he would uh, try to get the Russian Orthodox Church back together is all illustrating, it would seem, some way for that image to stand. Now, in the... A time we have. I'm going to have to rush through this because uh, there, there are some really interesting aspects to this uh, and I would just leave them for you to consider because we do know that Ezekiel 38 verse 8 tells us that the, the people of Israel have got to be in the focus of Russia when it comes down with its, its uh, other horde of nations. We do know that the same Bible passage says that these people have got to dwell confidently, safely or confidently. Now, the news provides little glimpses of how this might actually be, because it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to try to figure out. You mean that Israel doesn't have any walls? It's probably the country with the most walls of any country in the world in terms of its defense. So what else could we mean? Now, this was the last Gulf War. And during the last Gulf War, which was just uh, in the last year, this is the prime example of confidence. This plant, which is Intel's plant, they're making chips in Israel, uh, they made an announcement with the government of Israel together. At the time the war was on, this place is in Gat, which is Gath. It's right on the border of Gaza, where this plant is. And missiles had to go over that to get to the airport near Ben-Gurion. 
So it illustrates that someone's got a lot of confidence in their ability to defend the place. If during a war, when rockets are flying over the plant, people decide they're going to put a $6 billion expansion of their investment in Israel, I'd say that's confidence. Can you imagine that happening in any other country of the world? So things that you would hardly believe possible happen in Israel and continue to happen in Israel. Like we had no idea of this 50 years ago. We had no idea of this 20 years ago, that these great gas discoveries off the Mediterranean coast of Israel would lead to Israel being a producer of gas and, and being prepared to sell it to other nations in the area and possibly to Europe. And so we've seen these huge ships now uh, becoming maybe the, the, the way that people would view ships at the sea because they're an LNG, liquid natural gas uh, tanker, where large part of those big domes there is, is just the insulation to keep it cold enough to keep it liquid. And that's being transferred from the wells where, or at least places where they, they uh, liquefy it uh, to other places around the world. And, and the world's changing in this aspect because we see these ports uh, popping up around the world that can handle these tankers and take advantage of the fact that uh, a lot of gas can come in the liquid form. Well, again, you see, it's, it's God. I will bring thee against my land. And uh, you will come like a storm. It's, it's not going to be missiles, brothers and sisters. It couldn't be missiles. The Bible record in Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of soldiers coming in so that it takes seven months to bury them. There's so many dead bodies because of, of invading soldiers into the land of Israel. So when we see like a storm, like a cloud, uh, covering the land, it may be something like this, of a very quick advance of troops into the area is how they intend to, to invade Israel. Now here's a more modern chart. We do make charts, but the charts today are not made out of cloth. They're not made on a, on a person's floor. They're designed on a computer and they're made on vinyl. And that chart is 12 feet long and eight feet high and it makes a wonderful uh, backdrop to a stage when you're having a lecture like this to the public. And I, I don't think I've ever seen anything create an atmosphere in uh, a large public theater like charts of this variety with lighting on them. And when people come in, there just is an atmosphere that's set out for them. So we continue to make these charts. And this chart, uh, we used that in the public. We went down out into the uh, open parks. I don't know if you have parks in New Zealand where they allow you to do this, but we do have one in Hamilton where we uh, live. In fact, uh, the park is Gage Park. And when you do a little investigation of Gage Park, Gage was a Christadelphian. <laughs> and you know, there's some really interesting stories about how the truth advanced in Southern Ontario and how John Thomas made his trip through those cities he was in Hamilton, he was in Paris, he was in Toronto, and he visited those places. And uh, hence, I don't know that there is anybody that would have any contact with that, even in family lines. There's people in, in Toronto and in uh, Canada generally are very disinterested in the Bible. 50 years ago, you could go down in the public park, you could talk about it, and people would have a Bible, and they would have enough knowledge of it that they could follow what you're saying, but not today. And today they, they just ignore you. It's a different world. It's going to be so much harder for our children to make the same points that we have been making. How much harder again for our grandchildren to make that point in public? Because they have nothing. I at least can remember as a child being in a park where brethren did this and doing it myself later on. But unless we do these things, there will be a generation have a hard time ever knowing Yahweh, the one who says that he will do this. The Jews are God's witnesses. We know that from that verse. I just want to share a little story with you. You may know this, you may not know this. I did not know this until I read the book that was written about the discoveries of scrolls in Masada. 
It was 1956, and it was uh, the man Yigal Yadin. He was the one who was charged by Israel to find scrolls in Israel when the first Dead Sea Scrolls be became, uh, people became aware of them. Then he was the one on Israel's behalf that led the expeditions to find any other scrolls. Well, he eventually went down uh, to Mas Masada. And those scrolls were 1947. Uh, this is 1956, so it was some time afterwards. Now that is a mighty place to go. If you ever visit Israel, you wanna go to Masada because this was Herod, the Herod that built the temple in Jerusalem, had built this place as his palace, and it was protected down here. There's nothing around. There's, there's no vile, uh, uh, someone to vie for his, his possession of that, although you know, the, the Jewish rebels managed to get in there just at the time of the fall of Jerusalem, and so it gave the Romans some real trouble for a few years afterwards, and I don't have the time to explain this part here, but that's not... Uh, an original, that's a, a man-made ramp that's still visible from the air as how the Romans managed to get up to the top part of, of Masada. And uh, they thought there might still be some scrolls up there. So they did their investigation on the top and they found the place on the wall, which they thought must be a synagogue that was used by the zealots sometime in AD maybe 71, 72, 73, just a little after the destruction of Jerusalem. So what they had to do was they had to dig around. And uh, many cases, if they hadn't dug, they would never have found anything. So uh, Sister Dorothy and I were up there. We walked around and, and this was the place. It's, uh, it was a synagogue in Geniza. Geniza is just a word for a grave for scrolls because the Jews wouldn't burn them, they wouldn't destroy them, they wouldn't throw them out, they buried old scrolls. So they thought there could be some old scrolls buried under that. Now just think of this, because I felt this was sensational. Like it was one of the most sensational parts I felt for Christadelphians out of all the Dead Sea Scrolls being discovered, because they dug underneath the synagogue and uh, found that there was a couple places in the floor that obviously had been filled up by something. You could tell by the, the dirt there was different. And they dug down very carefully, like this wasn't with a shovel. They were digging with a, maybe a, a toothpick or something like that to make sure that there were any scrolls, they wouldn't be destroyed. They didn't find anything in a jar here, but they did find an old scroll. I don't know if you can see a little bit of writing, that's all that was left of it. Just a little bit of writing on a scroll. But it was enough writing to identify where it came from. And I thought it was just sensational that Yigal Yadin wrote it up. That's a picture from his book. It's the actual page. And it says, portions of the Ezekiel scroll containing the vision of, of the dry bones, which were found in the second pit under the floor of the synagogue. And he made nothing of it. You see, the Jews don't make anything of that. But the Christadelphians would. And if I had known about it, I could have made much use of this many years before that. But, but this is what it said. Like that part, uh, fleshed out, says this. Son of man, this is Ezekiel 37, verse 11. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried, our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you will know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And, you shall, and I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, saith Yahweh. Well, all of that is not fulfilled. But what a sensational find. They're looking in a Geniza. That's a grave. They're looking in a place where you would never, ever expect to find a scroll. And 2,000 years approximately before they found it, someone had buried it because it had to be done in the years 
A.D., I think, 71, 2 or 3. Some were just after the destruction of Jerusalem. Just after the bones, became, the bones of Israel became apparent. And then when Israel is being revived and the bones are coming together and the skin's coming on them and this, this, is, this great group of people are about to become alive, someone digs in that place where these people, one of the last people of the land of Israel, where they were, and the, the zealots in, in Masada, they dig under and they dig and they dig until they find this old piece of a scroll, just a piece of a scroll, but enough of it to, to actually identify Ezekiel 37. I think that's pretty sensational. I think that's the kind of proof that God provides for us who believe these things, to be able to see that this is actually happening before our eyes is the kind of evidence that we need to be able to offset the other things that are happening to try to destroy our faith. And we'll leave it there.